Hello, and welcome to the next set of Chem 1A lecture videos. In this series, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics in chemistry, which is bonding. Particularly for this video, we're going to address the different types of bonds. We've already talked a little bit about these in previous modules, but we're going to focus in a lot more detail on the similarities and differences between chemical bonds. At the end of this video, you should be able to classify them as ionic, pure covalent, or polar covalent. Before we get started, just what is a chemical bond? So a chemical bond is really the balance of charge interactions that occur between different atoms. So we have nucleus-nucleus repulsions. Nuclei are positive, they're gonna repel each other. We have electron-electron repulsions. Electrons are negative, they're gonna repel each other. And then we also have electron-nuclear attractions. So the positive nuclei are gonna be attracted to the negative electrons. And a bond is formed when the potential energy of the interacting atoms is lower than the potential energy of the atoms by themselves. So basically a bond is just an energy lowering associated with two atoms coming together. The picture that we have of that looks something like this. So for two atoms, we are looking here at the distance between them. Um, that's the internuclear distance and the potential energy. So when they're fully separated, our potential energy is zero. When they're very close together, the positive charge in the nuclei is going to dominate and it's going to push them apart. And then somewhere in the middle, we have a happy medium and that's where our bond is gonna happen. And the bond length is gonna generally occur at that minimum distance. And the bond energy is the energy lowering associated with those atoms coming together. If a bond is formed by the interaction of atoms, it's actually the valence electrons that do most of the bonding. These are the electrons that are most loosely associated with the nuclei. And so they're the ones that can interact with other nuclei the most easily. And so chemical bonding generally involves the valence electrons being either transferred or shared. And there's really three types of bonds. The, the two that we focus on the most are ionic bonds and covalent bonds. In ionic bonds, we have metals interacting with nonmetals, and we have the full transfer of electrons. In covalent bonds, we have nonmetals interacting with nonmetals, and electrons are shared. And then we also have this third category, which is metallic bonds, where we have basically a pooling of electrons. And so we're going to explore each of these in some more detail in the coming slides. First, let's look at ionic bonds. So ionic bonds occur whenever you have oppositely charged ions that are attracted to each other. So this prototypical example is sodium chloride, where we have the chlorine having taken the electron from sodium now has a negative charge and the sodium which lost its electron has a positive charge. Those are gonna be attracted to each other and those attractions occur in all directions. And in general, metals will lose electrons to form cations. And that's because metals have a relatively low ionization energy. So if you remember from your periodic trends, it's relatively easy to remove electrons. Um, and they also don't really, metals also don't want more electrons. So they have a low ionization energy and also a low electron affinity. This means that it's gonna be easier to remove than to add electrons. In nonmetals, we have the opposite situation where they have a high electron affinity, they want the electrons, and they have a high ionization energy. They don't want to give up their electrons. And so in that case, it's going to be easier to add electrons than to remove them. And so this combination results in electrons being transferred and we get an ionic bond. Ionic bonds also lead to the formation of ionic compounds. Ionic compounds generally just contain ionic bonds. This can also include polyatomics as one of the ions. But this attraction, as we just said, is non-directional. So it, it happens in all directions. And we have no ionic molecule. Basically, we just have an ionic substance because all of the atoms are attracted together at the same time. And then the other thing about ionic compounds is that they're generally crystalline solids. So sodium chloride is one example. Here's another example. This, this structure corresponds to cesium chloride, but they're crystalline. They're, pure, they're arranged in very regular patterns. Um, and this leads to a lot of their properties, such as 
the fact that they're solids, they're large extended structures. They conduct electricity when they're turned into liquids. So if you heat these compounds up enough that they do melt, then you're gonna have ions that can move around each other and will have charge that can move. And if they are soluble in water, they're also gonna have that charge available. They'll form electrolytes. So now let's talk about covalent bonds, which are generally bonds that happen between nonmetals. So here, neither of the atoms is gonna to wanna to give up its electrons. And so the best they can do is to share. Um, and generally the sharing happens directly between two atoms. So it's a one directional share. Um, this means that covalent compounds are also gonna have definite structures. They're gonna have three dimensional orientations besides just spheres packing together. You get in ionic compounds, and the energy for a pair of electrons between a pair of atoms is going to be lowest when the electrons are directly in between the atom. So that's what's being illustrated in this picture down here. Basically, our, our most stable state is going to be when we have the negative charge directly between the positive charges. So we know that a covalent bond is the sharing of electrons, but we also need to be able to represent that on paper when we're talking about atoms and molecules. And because not all valence electrons may be participating in bonding. We're going to, to distinguish between bonding electrons, which are the ones that are shared between atoms, and the non-bonding electrons, which are the ones that are localized on a single atom. And so you'll notice that we're talking a lot about pairs of electrons. And the reason for that really goes back to when we were thinking about atomic orbitals, because we saw there that each one can hold two electrons, one that spin up and one that spin down. And it's generally going to be more stable if those shells are filled, and so electrons tend to want to pair up. It gets very tiresome to draw out individual electrons all the time, so it's more common that bonds are represented as lines. But remember, the bond itself is really just an electrostatic interaction. The lines are just something that we draw to, to help ourselves think about it on paper. And it turns out that one pair of electrons could be shared, but we could also have more pairs of electrons that are shared. And so that's where we get this concept of multiple bonds. So we can have single bonds where we have one shared pair of electrons, as well as double bonds with two shared pairs or triple bonds with three shared pairs. Those electrons also don't have to be shared equally. So if we have a molecule like hydrogen fluoride, where we have a hydrogen atom and a fluorine atom, which are not equivalent, one has a much higher nuclear charge than the other, we end up with an unequal sharing. So fluorine wants the electrons more, it's going to pull them closer to itself. And so that creates this unequal charge distribution, which we call a dipole. And this unequal sharing is represented in two, one of two ways. It can be represented with the dipole arrow, where we show the plus sign on the positive end, so that's the side that's lacking electrons, and the arrow pointing towards the negative end, which is the side with the extra electrons, or it can be represented with this delta plus delta minus notation. So the delta plus just means we have a partial positive charge. It hasn't transferred the electron fully, but it's, it's given up more of, of the electron than it's sharing back from fluorine, and fluorine has pulled more of that electron towards itself why it ends up being negative. And this is what we call a polar bond or a polar covalent bond. So polar bonds, again, just happen when we have unequal sharing of electrons. If we have more electrons on one side of the atom than the other, there's going to be basically a higher density of electrons that's going to be associated with a higher negative charge. And if we're thinking about sort of where do we draw the line between a shared electron and a transferred electron, it really ultimately comes down to the properties of the material. If, if it has the same properties as an ionic compound, we would classify it as ionic. Otherwise, it gets classified as polar covalent. And we'll talk a little bit more in just a minute about where you would make that distinction. In order to know which way the electrons are gonna go, we need some way of talking about that. And that comes through this concept of electronegativity, which is basically just the ability of an atom to pull electrons towards itself. So we saw that fluorine really liked electrons. That's indeed the case. It is the most electronegative element in the entire periodic table. 
So every element has some value associated with it, which is known as the electronegativity. In, in some periodic tables, this is written out, but it's something you can look up either way. And so the more polar bonds are going to occur when you have a larger difference in that electronegativity with the more electronegative element getting more of the electrons. So here's the picture of the periodic trends. So fluorine has the highest value of four, francium has the lowest value of 0.7, and that the electronegativity generally increases as you move up and also as you move over on the periodic table. And as we saw with many of the other periodic trends, there's a lot more variation within the, the transition metals. Um, generally, you don't need to worry about those too much for purposes of this class. If we have a bond between two atoms and we want to know whether it's polar or nonpolar, we can take the electronegativity difference and calculate a value. And so if that difference is very small, we would classify it as covalent. Um, this is also sometimes called pure covalent or nonpolar bonds. And that's always going to be the case when you have two of the same element. And there's other cases where they have very similar electronegativities. We also have this intermediate range where we have polar covalent bonds, such as HCl. And then when it gets large, when that difference is larger than two, we would have an ionic compound, such as sodium chloride. So really, we have a continuum of differences in electronegativity. We go all the way from nonpolar, where the electrons are completely shared equally, to ionic, where one electron is completely transferred to the next atom. Another way of talking about this, in addition to just the electronegativity difference, is the percent ionic character. So this is basically just a difference in measuring the dipole compared to what, what it would be if that electron was fully transferred. Um, and it just indicates the degree of electron transfer. So I can also put in the divisions that we had on the previous slide for the electronegativity difference. And we see that we have some nonpolar compounds that are gonna be down here. They have very low percent ionic character. There's quite a bit of variation in the polar region where we can go anywhere from maybe about 10 to 12% ionic character up to about 75% ionic character. And then once you get above that, we would classify it as essentially an ionic compound. So there's one more type of bonding that we should at least touch on in a little more detail, which is metallic bonding. So in metallic bonding, electrons are shared between a lot of atoms. So again, this is a non-directional interaction. It's spread all throughout the metal. And so this results from the attraction of the cations to the electrons that are sort of moving all around. Sometimes this is referred to as an electron C. And so some of the, the properties of metallic compounds are really directly related to metallic bonds in that they're conductive. It's very easy to move electrons around. Therefore, it's very easy to move charge and heat um, through, through metals. So they're very easy to deform if you squish them or pull on them. The, the electron C basically compensates for any change in structure. And as with ionic compounds, they tend to have very high melting and boiling points. We can also talk about the strength of the bonds in terms of the, the number of delocalized electrons. So the more electrons there are, the, the harder it's going to be to pull those, those metal atoms apart, as well as the charge and size of the ions. So in wrapping up this section, I want you to take away the idea that there's actually a continuum of bonding. We have purely covalent compounds, we have purely ionic compounds, we have purely metallic compounds that sort of represent each of these different types of bonding. But then in between, we have more variation. And the main variation we're gonna worry about is polar bonding, which happens somewhere between covalent and ionic. And that can be determined based on that, those differences in electronegativity. In the next video in this series, we'll take a look at the strength of ionic and covalent bonds and how you would determine that information.